Ralph Nader has written a new book, Unsafe at Any Speed, and I think everyone probably knows him because he has been very active in, well, the safety of cars and trying to, uh, uh, to do something about this. Do you have any comments right at the very first as to how much progress has been made since uh, you started, uh, perhaps we might just say, being critical? Well, I think uh, progress is in two areas. Uh, one is that the public is much more aware now of the role of the vehicle uh, in causing accidents and, more importantly, in causing injuries once accidents occur. I think uh, the second major area of progress is that there's now a federal law uh, that requires the government to set safety standards for all new vehicles and, by 1969, for used vehicles as well, as well as a number of other areas in traffic safety uh, which will receive greater attention and money from the federal government. Yes, a great deal of attention has been given, I know, and a great deal of time you have given uh, toward the design of the car. And uh, I wonder, though, how much uh, have you been concerned with the individuals driving the car? Yes. Well, my book was on the uh, motor vehicle aspect of traffic safety. Obviously, drivers have a part to play as well. I think it's important, however, uh, to note that we can't put uh, the majority of our emphasis only on the driver, because the driver is much more difficult to control than the design of the vehicle. And uh, that although we must continue to uh, improve our driving uh, performance and uh, better highways, uh, the vehicle is the single most controllable factor uh, that will cut the causal chain uh, between uh, the uh, contributing factor to the accident and the injury. Uh, the best example I know of that is that when an accident occurs, uh, the only way people are killed or injured uh, is the way they interact with the inside of the car. Sharp edges, in instrument panel, the door pops open on them, they're thrown out, the steering column ramrods back into the driver and so forth. And so once accidents do occur, as they will, unfortunately, again and again, the vehicle is the only thing that can save uh, the people in the car from being injured or killed in the accident. So the vehicle is a wonderful second line of defense uh, if it is designed to be crash-worthy enough to protect people in collisions that are now uh, not survivable, but, but certainly should be if the manufacturers wanted them to be. Now, should somebody take up the uh, crusade, however, to uh, do something about uh, better educating our drivers? Well, the uh, law, which was passed last year, provides for large federal support for driver training programs in the 50 states. I think uh, our driver education programs are too much classroom oriented and not enough uh, behind the wheel oriented. Uh, I know in Iowa, for example, 30 hours are devoted to classroom uh, education, only six hours behind the wheel. Uh, I think that recently has been changed to, I believe, 12 hours, but even so, the ratio is totally inadequate. It's far more important to get them behind the wheel uh, with uh, uh, adequate equipment and techniques so that they know how to behave in an emergency situation, in a skid, and other situations that will confront them. Now, do we have proper legislation that takes care of the, uh, the difficulties as human beings that we have with sight and some of these uh, afflictions that make us not prime uh, car drivers? Yes, that again is uh, an area which will receive greater emphasis. That is, people who have physical disabilities will be checked periodically, particularly eyesight. In fact, everybody is going to be checked for eyesight every four years uh, in order to determine whether uh, they are still capable of uh, driving a car adequately. If they're not, their license, unfortunately, will have to be taken away from them. What about reaction time? Reaction time is uh, more difficult to measure. Um, uh, <coughs> the uh, the problem of clear vision is something you can determine with some precision. Reaction time, however, is something which you can't particularly draw a line to uh, as easily as you can in vision, but I'm sure they're going to have to take that into account. You can't be too strict. You can't be too strict on this, because if you are, you'll find yourself stripping half the drivers of their license, and if you do that, you'll find half our industry breaking down because nobody can reach them to go to work. <laughs> well, and of course, uh, reaction time, uh, even uh, with the normal person, a uh, normal healthy person, uh, is going to vary from uh, one hour to the next in That's many right. cases. Now, reaction time for elderly drivers is quite important. There's where you get a gradual deterioration until 
a certain point is reached where there simply is totally inadequate uh, mm -hmm. reaction time. So for older drivers, uh, uh, this will be an important measurement of uh, periodic driver uh, license uh, driver testing. Now, it is my understanding, and I don't want to get us off this, but it's my understanding that you are also uh, concerned now about uh, our meat industry. Oh, yes. Well, I think everybody should be concerned about the meat industry. At least all people who meet eat, eat meat. Well, now, <laughs> the, <laughs> what particularly uh, uh, bothers you? Well, roughly 25% of all meat processed in this country is processed within state boundaries. Therefore, uh, it escapes uh, federal inspection. The mm -hmm. U.S. Department of Agriculture does not have the jurisdiction to go into these in-state plants. And over the years, there has been a, a series of, uh, of uh, gross, uh, grossly unsanitary problems arising. The use of uh, 4D animals, dead, dying, diseased, disabled animals, uh, unsanitary conditions in the plants, and the use of um, uh, federally banned uh, chemical injections, coloring agents, uh, preservatives, to make putrid meat uh, more acceptable to the consumer. Um, Six years ago, Congressman Neil Smith from Des Moines introduced a bill in the House uh, to expand federal inspection service to include uh, most of these plants. Uh, now we have had hearings this year at the House level, and there's little question about that next year we will have a law passed that will lead toward the improvement of this extremely uh, discomforting, if not revolting, situation. And so that this would affect uh, the, uh, rather than just uh, affecting the interstate, it should fact, uh, in fact affect the intrastate and That's interstate. Right. See, much of uh, the uh, substandard meat, the diseased meat, finds its way into processed meat products uh, such as uh, hot dogs, uh, bologna, uh, and other similar products. And unfortunately, with the genius of modern chemistry, the uh, meat buyer can't even tell the difference. It's colored, preserved, seasoned, everything is camouflaged. Uh, well, is this going to be uh, something that the large uh, meat packers cooperate? Well, uh, most meat, large meat packers are federally inspected, but uh, even the largest ones have some plants operating within state boundaries that escape inspection and they have all the problems uh, that occur with some of the smaller meat packers. So it's not entirely a problem of the medium or smaller meat packers. Well, but now their products cannot carry then if it is not uh, packed. Uh, I was not expected. It cannot carry the seal and does not now carry the seal. That's right. But unfortunately, some uh, unscrupulous uh, firms will, ca will fake the seal so, so that they deceive people into thinking they have the USDA seal. But that is still the best... Uh, the best cue for the meat buyer. If he sees that USDA seal, um, mm -hmm. he can be sure that it's federally inspected. Well, now, is he going to put his plant number on it if it is faked? Uh, there are different versions. No, obviously, he's not going to identify his plant number because many of these plants don't have plant numbers because they're not inspected. Mm -hmm, but I mean, uh, the one that, as you say, the one that is the large packer that has uh, the off, not the off brand, but the yes. other brand, and that you can identify this many times by the stamp right. with the, the number. Now, That's if right. it has this stamp and number on it, it has been inspected? Yes, mm -hmm. generally speaking. There are some clever deceptions of the label. But generally speaking, it has been inspected. Unfortunately, the entire meat industry is opposing strengthening the law, mm -hmm. both large and small packers. Well, this will be interesting to follow, and at the same time, I'm sure that everybody will be interested in your comments and Unsafe at Any Speed, uh, which is your latest book, isn't it? Thank you. This is Ralph Nader.
Marie McGuire is Special Assistant on Problems of the Elderly, Housing, and Ur Urban Development with the Federal Government. Mrs. McGuire, how long and how did you happen to become interested in this field? Well, if I say it was before the war, that sounds like another era, <laughs> doesn't it? But actually it was in 1941, just before World War II, that I became interested in the, in the problem of community growth and uh, of low-income people in particular. Uh, this led me to return to school, uh, go to the University of Texas and take a school of architecture to be a little more knowledgeable about uh, how we were going to bring about communities during a war period, which was very imminent. I think we all knew it, sensed it. Uh, with the dislocation and relocation of so many family groups and yet have a good environment for children while fathers and mothers were, were uh, involved in war housing, I mean in war, war industry. And so this study led me to, to the low rent housing field. And of course, in this field of housing, automatically we come into contact with many older people because so many of our older people are in fact in the poverty sector. Yes, now we, uh, we seem to have also a general growing interest uh, in the aging problem in the older citizen. Do you have any ideas to why this is happening? Oh, it, it's not only growing, it's growing so massively that we have a whole new profession right here with us today that, that didn't exist uh, 10 years ago, even so long, uh, short a time ago, it's 10 years. Uh, it's growing, I think, primarily in response to the fa fact that the population itself is growing so rapidly. That is, in the older age groups, this is due primarily to uh, good medical science and research. We know how better to take care of ourselves today, and we've found the answer to some of the great killers of the past. And so, with this, uh, this uh, growing uh, number of older people, some 18 million today, expected to be about 30 million, people over 65 years of age by the time we reach 1972 or three, I think the forecast is. Uh, with this coming on, they're beginning to, re the older people are beginning to represent a bigger and bigger gr group in our society. This has caused us to stop, think a little bit, and say, uh, all right, what about this? Do people retire to rocking chairs and to uselessness and to loneliness and abandonment by the rest of society? Or do we uh, put our good uh, thoughts together and see what is the role of the older person and how we develop responsive uh, answers from the general society to their needs? Well, in many attempts to uh, develop responsive uh, programs, there have been a number of programs that have developed now, is this sanctioning uh, separation uh, from the families or sanctioning uh, f lack of family responsibility? 
or does this in, uh, involve something more? Oh, no, not at all. I don't think we have any basis whatsoever to indicate or to say with any validity uh, that sons and daughters love their parents less or that there's less feeling of responsibility for one's older, older members of one's family. Indeed, it's quite the shoes on the other foot. Uh, it's the older people themselves who want so to live that they don't have to be dependent on their children. Uh, that in short, uh, mother doesn't want to sit by the hearth of her daughter as her role in life, uh, particularly since she has 15, 20, or maybe 30 years uh, after she's a great grandmother to, to live a long while. And she wants a definite and he wants a definite role in society for himself, a fulfilling role, a creative one, a one for different opportunity and different excitement, retraining, re-education, all the alive, vivid, lively things of life, rather than, than the retirement into loneliness, despair, and perhaps dependence on one's family. What has really happened is that the community now is taking up the role and fulfilling the, the spaces in life that the family once did, when it was a normal thing to have older or several generations living under one roof. The house was big enough. There was a role for the older person, not just babysitting, which is certainly not fulfilling for anyone as a full-time pursuit. So the community organizations, the churches, the recreation groups, the volunteer groups of all kinds, in addition to government, all of these are by coming together now uh, to develop significant, enriching, and fulfilling roles for older people. And society generally, of course, will be the beneficiary. Well, since there are not the uh, family units that have either under the same roof or within, you know, down the street, a couple of houses, the entire uh, span of the generations. Uh, are we replacing this with housing units that, uh, that house uh, only given sectors of the population? In other words, uh, separate units for the elderly, uh, which are apart from the other community. Is this good, or do you have any comments to make about this? Yes, I do, because it's a matter of great concern to many people that uh, as the price sometimes of good housing within the paying ability of older people, we put a, a, a group of people together, all of one age, let's say a group from 65 to 85 or, or 65 up. And many people are troubled that this removal, a seeming removal of older people from the general population is a very bad thing, not only for the older person as a matter of identity and so on, and for his own self-esteem and status in society, but also it removes them from, from their effect, their good effect on younger people. Well, uh, I can't agree with this in relation to your question, which has to do with housing design, housing types. First, we start with the fact that all people are, have diverse interests. Older people certainly have diverse interests and tastes and desires. We should build enough housing and enough variety to respond to each person's desire. But if, uh, if you are putting people, let us say, in a high-rise apartment building, and you're putting families next to older people, and older people just under where family lives, overhead, and so on, it becomes a very chaotic and uh, awful situation for the older person. For instance, uh, the older person may now, now that he has the leisure, may want to sleep until 9 o'clock every morning, but he has to wake up and get up at 6 because that's when the baby cries next door. Mm -hmm. Or he likes to go to bed early, or she does, and the teenager is dancing until 2 in the morning. Well, it seems to me, if there's anything we have earned the right to once we have reached our later years, it's to have our own pattern and schedule of living. This is not possible when you bring all age groups together. And so I say, we must insulate in our housing programs the old person from the patterns of life of the younger, but we must not isolate them from the younger people or from the community, which is just as important. I think probably a, a good way to do is to have a high rise if it's high rise or cottage or two story buildings for older people, but separated a bit, a bit from the younger, but within reach of them, but mm -hmm. within reach and within uh, individual communion with them. Now, can the community centers then serve part of this span of the ages then if they serve more than one group? Well, the community centers present something of the same idea, but for a different reason. We've had some wonderful research done in recent years in this country and abroad trying to decide whether it's better to have a community center, since the community center program, you know, is emerging as one of the very interesting expressions of the growing urban culture in this country particularly, uh, whether these community centers should again serve all age groups and uh, at different times or at the same time. And the studies that have been done primarily at Western Reserve University uh, have indicated very definitely that 
that if we try to combine older age groups with younger in, an acti in activity centers, uh, older people will look on and will enjoy it, but they will not participate. And so again, we say they don't want to be in competition mentally or physically with younger people. And this is understandable. So that if we want participation, if that's the goal, then let's have pe age peers together rather than a great diversity of age. This uh, is interesting, and, and as I said, I'm sure that we can't say in 10 minutes that which you make of a lifetime work now. So thank you very much for sharing some of these provocative thoughts with us. And this has been Marie McGuire, Special Assistant on Problems of the Elderly, Housing, and Urban Development with the Federal Government. Thank you very much, it's Mrs. McGuire. It's a joy being here. It's important to me. <laughs> <laughs> Although they're real good because they wave these around and they'll sign you, you know, you do, you do something so that you, they know that oh. you've seen it. Listen, what is the key to re- uh, you're so